All right, all right. Happy Thursday, guys. Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Garland Nixon. He is the host of The Garland Nixon Show on YouTube, and he also hosts a radio show on Sputnik Radio. Welcome back, Garland. All right. Thank you for inviting me, Savvy. Glad to be back on your channel. Well, a lot has happened since you've been here last time uh, politically, uh, especially in reference to foreign policy. So I'm sure you know that Victoria Newland decided to retire. Uh, it was actually announced here. Victoria Newland, third highest ranking U.S. diplomat and critic of Russia's war in Ukraine, is retiring. And there's been a lot of criticism from people wondering why she would choose to retire at a time uh, during the Ukraine war where obviously Ukraine is not doing well. And I wanted to get your opinion about that. Do you question the timing of her retirement? Well, I, I think, um, you know, there's great speculation and certainly, you know, I imagine that we will at some point get more information in the future and maybe all of our speculation will be will have been wrong. But my understanding is that she voluntarily left and um, that I've heard that she just stopped showing up and then she voluntarily left. I do recall what's interesting is just before she left, she said, oh, we are going to have some big surprises for Russia in the coming weeks, which is interesting because the State Department, you're a diplomat and a diplomat, you know, saying we're going to take military action. That certainly seems counterintuitive. But at any rate, um, I believe speculating that um, she started to see the writing on the wall that the Ukraine project was crashing, that the um, support for um, the intensity of, of support for the conflict that she wanted to continue was evaporating. The people around her, albeit that they're totally and absolutely insane warmongers, have a little bit more sanity, not much, a little bit more sanity than her. I think also the um, the clash between the uh, China hawks and the um, Russia hawks intensified. Um, certainly, the conflict in the um, in the in the in the uh, in the Middle East is starting to you know get get uh, uh, more intense. So the bottom line was, I think uh, Victoria New Victoria Newland saw Ukraine versus Russia as the only thing that mattered. This was hers. This was her baby. Everything should be dropped for that. And I think when she saw that, um, it was fading away in the as far as being the um, number one issue for the Biden administration. I think she faded away also. I also think it could have been, uh, you know, rats jumping off a sinking ship too, where she's like, oh, this thing's going to go bad. It's all mine. Why don't I just get out of here now? And, and I won't take all the, let somebody else, you know, take the, uh, take the hit. Well, you know, she stepped down before, uh, before the, the Trump administration, when uh, Trump won in 2016, it was very obvious that she didn't want to serve under or work under uh, Donald Trump's administration. And this actually made me wonder, do you think, do you think that she has like, not that she knows for sure, but do you think that she is also being somewhat cautious about the fact that Donald Trump could win again in 2024 and she's just trying to go ahead and get out now? I think she sees the walls closing in in a number of areas, and that's one of them. She sees the Ukraine, the Ukraine, her Ukraine pro project, which was her baby, um, collapsing. She sees the support for the Biden administration collapsing, meaning that the potential for Donald Trump coming in um, is is uh, is is rising. And I think she just saw this is a bad situation, and she wants out. You know, she's there's no honor amongst thieves. So she's not going to stand around and go down with the ship. She's going to go to the center for the strategic uh, uh, completion of horrible things or some other, you know, brutal neocon think tank and and Monday back Monday morning quarterback, the people that are in. And when she leaves now, as it collapses, she can say, well, if they'd have listened to me, this wouldn't be happening. You know what I mean? That's the great thing. She now goes to this, uh, you know, one of these think tanks and can just says, if they'd have only listened to me, if they'd have only went along with what I told them to do, they wouldn't have had this problem. So it's a whole lot easier on the outside for her. 
Interesting. I'm also curious in reference to uh, Ukraine. I did see recently that the U.S. government just sent a hundred million dollars to Ukraine. How long do you think this is going to continue considering the fact that it's obvious that Ukraine is not winning this this war? They're losing on the battlefield. Um, I actually read something that they're actually trying to get females to actually, <laughs> you know, fight on the field because they're losing like soldiers and et cetera. How long do you think it's going to continue that the U.S. government is going to uh, fund Ukraine? Well, right now, um, the the Democrats are trying to get ninety five billion through the house. One hundred million is nothing. You know, I mean, the contact line between Russia and Ukraine is somewhere. I don't know. I've heard so many different numbers somewhere between eight hundred and say eighteen hundred miles long. Hundred million dollars ain't going to do much for that. For what Ukraine needs to even keep going, and of course, as, as you say, the money's not going to do them any good. A lot of the weaponry is not there to be pr- pr- uh, purchased because it hasn't been made. It's on order, whatever. And of course, they're running out of personnel. The losses are so heavy they can't replace the, the personnel. Even if they had the weapons, there's nobody to fire them. So um, I think that. Um, now that Donald Trump clearly has a pretty good grip on the Republican Party, it, it's going to be, you know, lame duck season for the Democrats. Basically, the Republicans, for the most part, are saying we're not giving you much of anything. We're not giving you any money. And let's just let this thing. Let, let, we're, they're going to head on into the um, into the uh, into next November, the election. But they're not giving the Democrats much of anything. Do you think Joe Biden will try to send U.S. troops into Ukraine? And I I ask just because I know France made an announcement recently that they're willing to do that. Well, a couple of things. France is saying they're willing to do that, but they don't have the wherewithal to do that. You know what I mean? They don't. What can they? Let's say France is able to muster. Let me just give a really high number for them, which they can't. 50,000 troops, right? Okay. And let's say they send them in with no air cover. You know what I mean? You're going to send these troops into an environment like that where Russian could just pound them with missiles with no real air cover, no planes, no nothing. Any of that stuff's going to get shot down. You have to go from France. If you think about this, uh, France, you have to go to the border of a superpower to fight that superpower on its border. It can fire at you from within its own airspace. It can just sit back and fire surface to surface missiles from its own airspace all day long. It can fire. It can drop uh, those big fab 500, 1500 pound bombs from its own airspace and glide them in to hit you. It doesn't even have to come in range where you can hurt. So it would be suicide for France to do it. I doubt very seriously if they will do it. Also, I was just reading an article where the polls say the French people ain't down with that at all. The French people are like, yeah, no, thanks. We we, we kind of have a, a a bit of a historical reference here. And uh, we remember what happened when 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 uh, Napoleon went in. So would Macron even do it if he could? Uh, also, I might add, there was an article I just I recently read Moon of Alabama. And in there, one of the things that they brought up is that the French military leaked a confidential a memo to the press that basically said, uh, Ukraine's done. They have no chance of winning. Now, if the French military leaked that, they leaked that for a reason. So he doesn't have the support in his military. He doesn't have his, the support in um, his population. The idea that he can take his troops on a suicidal mission to the border of a superpower when the military itself and the people are not down with it, I find it hard to believe he'll be able to accomplish that one. Do you think Joe Biden will try to send U.S. troops there? No, no. Joe Biden's not going to do that. For what? Look, I've said all along, if the Ukrainians think that the neocons are going to sacrifice anything for them, they're fools. I'll, I'll go one further. If the Russians were the Baltic states, the what are they? These uh, postage stamp size states that have, you know, roughly the uh, the population of a large American city. OK. These, I mean, like one of them is like 1.6 million for the entire country, right? I don't, if I'm not mistaken, I live in the state of Maryland. I think all three of the Baltic states together have somewhere around the population of Maryland or less. 
So I don't think the Russians are losing a whole lot of sleep over the Baltic states. But the fact of the matter is this. If the Russians woke up tomorrow and said, you know what, I think we're just going to attack the Baltic states and tear them to shreds. I will guarantee you this. The Biden administration wouldn't do Article 5. They wouldn't sacrifice anything. They'd say, well, guys, uh, we've reviewed Article 5 and uh, we're just going to do more sanctions on the Russians. They're not going to look at your history. The U.S. leadership is not going to sacrifice anything for these people. They're the cannon fodder. Their job is to be the cannon fodder for us. Our job is not to go in and sacrifice anything for them. So people are mistaken in thinking that, especially those countries thinking that the U.S. is going to come fly into the rescue if they get in a world of trouble. They'll leave them high and dry. I want to pivot to uh, Israel and Gaza. Obviously, this has kind of taken, I would say, the front page news away from Russia and Ukraine, to be honest with you. Uh, but there have been a number of uh, uncommitted or no preference votes that were cast in the Democratic primary race. Uh, interestingly enough, also here in Massachusetts, there were actually uh, Republicans that also voted no preference uh, in the Republican primary. Uh, so there are a number of people that are speaking out in such a way, letting uh, the administration know that they are not willing to support Joe Biden uh, or they're not willing to support uh, Donald Trump in reference to Israel and Gaza. Over 100,000 people in Michigan uh, alone voted uh, uncommitted. What do you think this means in reference to how foreign policy will affect the election? And I ask that question because this is the first time since I've been able to vote where I feel like more Americans are focused on foreign policy. And I, I want to get your take on that. Do you feel like some of these uncommitted votes, th this is my big question. When November comes around and we're in the general election, are all those people who voted uncommitted going to stay home? Are they going to go out and support Joe Biden regardless? Or what do you think is going to happen? Um, yeah, I think they'll stay home. I think, you know, Margaret Campbell wrote a great um, or, uh, article. I think she wrote it. Anyway, it was it was in Black Agenda Report. She's the editor for Black Agenda Report. And what they said is black people could learn from Muslims. And I've talked about this, too, because, you know, in the black community, they lie to you. They beat you over the head. They give you nothing. And every four years they come along and say, can we go into the black church and beg for votes? And then people go back and vote for them. the Muslim community. Say you get one choice chance. One. Stop the genocide. No, then we ain't voting for you. They're not coming back. They're not giving a bunch of chance. Nothing. They're done. They're finished. They're through. And I think that's good politics. Right. And I think that um, they mean business. I think that, um, no, they're not coming back. Right now, I don't see any way. If Biden's the nominee, God knows. they're. I mean, that's just suicide for the Democratic Party if he's the nominee. But if I, I see no chance of it. You have two factors. Number one, you have the um, foreign policy factor, which has infuriated the youth, the leftist, far, the left of the party. Really, 77% of the party is opposed to it. Right. But some of those are going to be scared to death of Trump. But you have that issue, which means you've lost the Muslim vote. You've lost the young vote and you lost a lot of people who are, who are. That's it. They're done. But. In to be quite frank, what I hear a lot in the black community is day to day cost. You know, in a black community, a lot of people are what? Working class, working poor. You know what I mean? A lot of working class people. Right. And their day to day life is, you know, they're paying too much for things. And they're upset about it. So you have that dual issue of those um, of us who are very, very cognizant of foreign policy, pay a lot of attention to foreign policy and are angry over Gaza. And then you have people who aren't maybe as much on foreign policy who are upset over um, economics. Either way, I mean, I see no way that the, that the um, the, the, that the, the Democrats, I don't care who they stick in there, Joe Biden or whoever, I see no path to victory for them. Do you think that's intentional? And, and I asked that question because some people have reached out to me and they said, Sabby, I think the Democratic Party wants to lose so that they can turn around and try to win in 2028. And this also brings in the TikTok situation, which I'm going to discuss this a little bit more later on tonight. But the TikTok situation. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to capture the youth vote, you just really blew it uh, with that one. And that legislation, the support for that was bipartisan. So it just makes me wonder, it makes me feel like, are they actually really trying to win? What do you think about that? Here's what I have to say. They always prefer to win. 
but they have a list of priorities. Let's not forget, Nancy Pelosi said that, uh, and a lot of people, I don't, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but what she said basically was that I don't care if the capital crumbles down around us, our support for Israel, Israel will still be here, right? So what she's really saying is, look, yeah, do we want to win, but we don't care if we lose every seat. We got a priority. Our priority is we're going to support Israel. So if we lose, we lose. They have priorities. What you're seeing is the ruling elite. It's be, being more and more, becoming more and more obvious. It's becoming glaringly obvious that the ruling elite do not represent the constituents of their party, of the constituents of this country, period. But the ruling elite's position is, well, who cares? So what? You're a Democrat right now and you lose. Who cares? You're going to go get a job. You will have no problem getting jobs. You'll work for a think tank. You'll work for the military industrial complex. Wall Street or hire you as a lobbyist. What do you care? The fact of the matter is, if you lose your seat, you'll make more money as an ex-congressman being rewarded for the evil deeds that you did, for the things that you passed to help these people make a billion dollars, you'll make more money. So what do you care if you lose? No matter what happens, you never lose. So they're in a situation where they're saying, we're going to do what we want. We're going to do, you know, who cares about the, um, the constituents? It doesn't matter. And I can't lose. Even if I lose my seat, there's going to be five golden parachutes. Well, do you want a job with Lockheed Martin, with the Center for Strategic whatever? Or would you just prefer to become a lobbyist for a Wall Street firm? You decide. You're getting paid. So what do they care? We're, it, 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 we don't even have any effect on their lives anymore as far as voters. They could care less. They're going to do what they're going to do. They don't represent us and whatever. Then they're out and they can just scream Trump for four straight years. I also feel like regardless if Biden wins or Trump wins, Israel still wins regardless, right? And I, I would hope more people would be willing to vote third party or independent uh, for the candidates that are, you know, in support of, of the Palestinian people. And I want to get your opinion about someone like RFK, because this is the part that really puzzles me. Uh, apparently, he has uh, a tremendous amount of support uh, with the youth vote, uh, which is weird because the youth is also against Joe Biden because of the Gaza issue. And I'm pretty sure that number is going to increase now because of the TikTok issue. Uh, but yet RFK Jr. seems to have grabbed, uh, I, I would say, a, a considerable amount of the youth support, considering that he's an independent candidate. Uh, also, at the same time, I saw a poll recently that showed that RFK Jr. has captured 13 percent of the African-American vote. It's interesting because when I mention RFK Jr. to people uh, here in the Boston area, most people don't even know. People tell me they don't even know this guy is running or they're like, who? So I'm like, where, where, where do you think the support is coming from? And then also, why do you think that is? Why do you think he's able to capture that percentage of the youth vote, which I think last time I checked was like 34% and 13% of the African-American vote? A couple of things. You've got voter desperation, right? So you've got people that are like, you know, any place is better than here. And so you've got a certain amount of people who are Democrats or Republicans or whatever, probably mostly more often than not Democrats, but Republicans or whatever, who look at RFK. They look at their their two options and they're like, I can't stand that. Oh, I'm going to vote for this guy. And the fact that they don't know about his um, much about him means that they don't know about his um, Israel policies. So they just assume that he's OK since he's not one of them. They don't really know that much. And so, boom, they drift over there and, hey, we'll try that. Try something different. Um, I also think uh, you got to add to the fact that his name's RFK Jr. So there are certain number of people who, you know, a nostalgia for, you know, some what they would like to believe the Democrats once were. Um, so I think that's that's what it is, a, a combination of name recognition, legacy, family legacy, and certainly um, people who are just, you know, would, you know, vote for a, a boulder rather than vote for Trump or Biden. He gets this 13 percent. That sounds about right. Interesting. And in the African-American community. Well, the African-American community, interestingly enough, you've got some of these. Um, uh uh, what do you call it? Some of these um, uh, battleground states that Trump's getting 20 percent. And I believe it, you know, because I talk to people in the black community and it's not rare for me to talk to people in the black community and feel them out and ha and and walk away saying that guy's going to vote for Trump. You know what I mean? I just happened over the weekend. I was at a memorial service for a friend, a fishing buddy of mine who had passed away suddenly of a heart attack. Tragic story. But bottom line was talking to one of our mutual friends and the guy has, is a business owner. 
And he was talking about, yeah, you know, when Trump was, he was, I think he was feeling me out because, and he's just a regular blue collar working middle class guy, you know? And he's like, yeah, you know, uh, things were a lot less expensive for my business when Trump was in. I, when I listened to him, I heard him basically saying, I was better off when Trump, oh, this is what, to sum it up, he was saying, economically, I was better off when Trump was in, right? Everything he had sums up to that. And there are simply people who are like, look, Trump can be what he is, all this other crap, man. I got, he's got kids to feed. He's got a mortgage. And so he, from his perspective, I may not agree with him, but from his perspective, hey, this things were a little bit better then. I, and, and they're terrible now and they're horribly, he was telling me his business, how much gas, how much he spends a day on gas for his, you know, gasoline for vehicles and his fleet and stuff. And I'm like, I'm listening like, mm. you know, <laughs> $900 or some crazy amount a month for groceries. And I'm like, holy crap. And so I understand. Maybe I don't agree, but just pure raw dollars and cents. There's a lot of people that are like, ah, I'd vote for the devil if I thought I could save a few bucks. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard it from a couple people too, that said that they voted for Biden in 2020, but this time they're going to vote for Donald Trump. And I'm like, what is happening here? Why do you think, uh, candidates like Cornel West and Jill Stein and, and Claudia de la Cruz, uh, don't have that same amount of support that RFK Jr. Does. Um, I, I think they have interesting, uh, platforms as well. Why do you think that they, with every poll that I look at, it'll show like Jill Stein or Cornel West at like 3% or 2%. Most of the time, Claudia's name isn't mentioned. Why do you think that they don't have the same amount of support that RFK Jr. Does? Well, you know, to me, um, I like Cornel West, but he's kind of flopped all over the place. You know what I mean? He's, he has not had a um, it hasn't been a smooth campaign. He's jumped from one party to the next. He's I've seen some issues where let's just say he could have been better informed on particular issues. And so I like I love Cornell West. I think he's a really good hearted, kind person. You know, that's what I like about him. He's a guy who's a kind person and he means all human beings well, based on what I've my experience with him. Right. But I just think he hasn't been a really good politician, you know, and mm. so he ended up being kind of a niche politician for certain people who know him or like him. Yeah, I'm going to vote for him. But he he's he can't get into the mainstream enough from flopping. He like when he started, he needed to get a direction to say, this is what I am. This is what I'm doing. Here's my focus. And I'm running forward with it. And he's a, had a problem because first he wants to be an outsider. But then he speaks the language of the insiders. He speaks the mm. language of the Yale, Harvard people. And that turns a lot of people off. That language turns a lot of people off. And um, he's a Yale. Didn't he go to Yale, I think? And Harvard. Started Harvard or something. Whatever the case. And that's the language he speaks. He doesn't have another language. So I don't think he's one of those people. But he speaks those language and pe that language. And people are so sick of those people he's associated with a class that people don't like and he's he's kind of as much as i like him i'll be honest he's bungled his candidacy jumping from place to place and not having a solid direction and a solid platform yeah i that was something i did say to him uh one of the times i i interviewed him on the show i did tell him like bouncing from group to group it gives people the impression that you don't know what you want to do unstable you know? People want, yeah. you know what? It's a, it, I think we hit on something. What do people want in a leader? Solid stability. They want a guy who's got his rudder, who knows this is my, um, uh, this is the way my compass is focused. And what do you want, Garland? This, this, and this. That's what I stand for. And people can say, okay, well, we know what that guy stands for. He's compass is heading north. He has not focused. Has a, you know, they will people want a, a guy who's going to tell them the direction and then maintain course and speed, as we say in the boating community, right? They don't know he doesn't have a, you know, they don't know where he's going and he hasn't maintained course and speed. And that's what people want. And, and, and nobody wants a leader who's going to feel his way around and change, I, particularly at times like these. Right. And I think also, like, even when I, I look at uh, Jill Stein's uh, candidacy, now she actually tends to do well in the state of Michigan. I think the last poll I saw, she had like 6%. This might have been a while back, though. She had like 6% in Michigan, but she was just actually in Dearborn, Michigan recently, uh, speaking to the Muslim community. Uh, do you think that 
her polling numbers will increase as we get closer to November and why or why not? I think her, I think her polling numbers will increase. I think all of the outsiders poll will, will you know, the outside, she's considered an outsider. Um, and in her case, it's not necessarily a good thing. You know what I mean? You got to at least seem like you're one of the contenders. She doesn't, yeah. she doesn't seem like she's one of the contenders. And so um, I don't think she has a legitimate chance of winning. Um, so I think, you know, again, she'll get people that are angry that people that want to do protest votes and, you know, things like that. I think she gets mostly the protest vote. I don't think people see her as a person that they really think has a legitimate chance of winning. I think RFK Jr., mm -hmm. the thing is they look at him and with the name and the family legacy, there are people who really do feel well, maybe this guy has a shot. I think with her and Cornell, people don't really believe that they have a shot of winning. And so um, there was an interesting article that I covered today where the Democrats just brought in a guy who, of all people, the, uh, who was the head of Pete Buttigieg's campaign. And he's going to now lead. He's, this guy's going to lead something, right? He's going to now lead their war. Literal, an NBC article says war on third parties. All the Democrats do is war. Now they're gonna have a war on other Americans, a war on third parties, which of course you mean, you know, means every filthy, dirty, rotten, fascist trick. I guess probably maybe they'll just go after and charge them all with 94 uh, charges and uh, say they all, you know, have RICO charges against all the third parties. I mean, that's what they're doing with Trump. What the hell? Why not go, why not go all out with it? Oh, people would be very angry if that happens, uh, especially, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, about the debates. And there have been rumors, or I should say rumblings, that Joe Biden is not going to debate Donald Trump. What do you think would happen if Joe Biden refuses to debate Donald Trump in the general election? Uh, two things will happen. Number one, um, the media, you know, the mainstream media will all support whatever cockamamie excuse he comes up with, you know, whatever malarkey he comes up with. Well, I'm not going to do it because I don't know. I don't want to validate Trump as a Putin puppet or something like whatever he does. The media will make every effort that they can to um, to support him and to help bail him out. Um, but bottom line, um, I don't think any of it's going to save him. I don't see a path for victory for for the for Joe Biden right uh, right now. I don't. There's no path for victory as far as I'm concerned. He's losing in all six battleground states and almost every one of them outside of the margin of victory. You lose Michigan as a Democrat, there ain't much of a path of victory for victory victory for you. And he don't I, right now. He has a doesn't have a prayer win in Michigan. And the the um, lawfare plan that they have to take Trump out using the Department of Justice seems to be collapsing. So it looks like it's going to be him and Trump. And I just, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, he would probably be, be smart. As I mean, just from the perspective of an analyst, he would probably be, be smart to duck out of a, a debate with Donald Trump if he could possibly find a way to do it, because the potential is there. <laughs> There is a potential for a catastrophic breakdown if he goes in there and he, you know, goes into one of those blank stairs and has what we used to call in the old Windows days the blue screen of death uh, while he's <laughs> while he's talking to Trump. It's it's really interesting. I, I think uh, one more question for you, Garland, because people keep talking about movement building. Uh, I was watching a movie last night called Rustin, and it's about uh, the gentleman Rustin who was a yeah, uh, civil rights activists. You've probably heard of him. Um, but one of the things I noticed in that movie, they're planning the March on Washington and they weren't just organizing obviously with like the NAACP. That's a whole nother story. Cause I felt like the NAACP was actually kind of moderate, uh, not radical, but they weren't just organizing with them, but they also actually organized with the workers. They organized with the UAW men members, right? So they had the union. So the March on Washington wasn't just about, you know, the civil rights and, and integration. It was also about the workers as well. Why can't we have that today? Why can't we have a movement or a March on Washington today that basically is a coalition of the, the workers, the unions, uh, along with, let's say, foreign policy, people who are protesting for support for Palestine, and all these other issues that we uh, tend to fight for. 
Well, uh, in, in the interest of transparency, I'm very, let me say this, I'm very familiar with the NAACP. When Kwaisi and Fumi was the president, my sister was the chief operating officer. She ran the NAACP for years. So I know the NAACP very, very well. And to say they're moderate is to give them the benefit of the doubt. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like saying, you know, the Congressional Black Caucus is moderate. They're part of the... Um, they're part of the black mis misleadership class. They're they're they sold they sold out years ago, right? There's the NAACP is a, 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 a joke as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're you know if the Democrats say jump, they're going to say how high. That bottom line. Um, and um, you know the it, what's interesting is what you're saying is uh, what I advocate for. When people say you know the black or the Latino or the, the LGBT or blah Q or blah blah whatever, I always say this. I, be, I see, I'm a leftist and in leftist, what I mean is this, I see politics through the lens of, of economic class before anything, even before race, even before race, right? I see the politics through the lens of economic class. And that, let's not forget, um, one of, uh, one of, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, part of one of the guys, I forgot which was it, Patterson, one of the guys that was part of uh, Martin Luther King's inner, inner circle was a communist. And in fact, RFK Jr. recently uh, berated the Constitution by saying, well, you know, I understand they had to, when they talked about, they asked him about the FBI, you know, bugging Martin Luther King and going after him. And RFK Jr. said something to the effect of, well, you know, I understand that because one of his close associates was a communist. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Constitution say you can be constitutionally a communist if you so choose? So what RFK Jr. was revealing is that, well, he's from a ruling elite family, is the ruling elite doesn't give a crap about the, the Constitution or any other rules. The rules are for us so we can believe that there's some kind of an organized society and rules that they go, that, that they go by. They completely disregard the rules. The bottom line is this. So because he had some people from the strong left, and let's not, he called himself a democratic socialist or something like that. I got my issues with that whole democratic socialist issue, but that's another story. But bottom line is he saw, he understood that the way to victory, the way to challenge the ruling class is to bring the masses together, to bring the working class together. And you get all of the masses to look at each other and say, what do we have in common? Number one, we're working hard and we're getting screwed by those people, all the same people. We have a common oppressor, right? So what did he do? He Martin Luther King's inner circle understood that the way to bring the masses together was to, what? Did, remember, it wasn't just for civil rights, it was for jobs. Yeah. They were demanding a $2 minimum wage, which would be like $17 right now, actually, far more than, <laughs> you know, but the bottom line is, um, they understood the real that that reality, and now we have people. You know, if you remember the Rage Against the War Machine, remember that. And there was a lot of people who were socialists on the left who opposed it. And I said, I don't. And I spoke. And when I spoke, what I said was, I'll make it quick. I know you only have but so much time. But basically, the 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 foundation of my speech was: Look, I grew up. My dad wore a hard hat. He was a longshoreman. He had a pickup truck. You know, he had hunting dogs. Um, I remember being outside in the cold, in the rain, work changing the brakes with my dad, you know, uh, things like that. And I said, and I bet there's a lot of people out here, there's libertarians, the conservatives that can tell the same story. That went fishing with my dad. I grew up and I, oh God, we got to go outside and do this or that or work or things like that. He was an old school, hard guy with not much education who worked hard, right? Down at the docks, a longshoreman. So I made the point to conservatives and libertarians, we got a lot in common. We all grew up in hardworking families. Then I went on to, to, to say those bastards that are doing all of this went to the elite schools. They were born rich. They got nothing in common with us. So I was making my point to people that I may have ideological dis, dis, disagreements with. Wait a minute. The working class, we got a lot in common. And we have a common oppressor. And the way to address the common oppressor is to come together as a group. We can have our disagreements, but bringing the working class together is what horrifies the um, people who are in power. That horrifies them. They, they're happy for us to fight each other, beat the hell out of each other, whatever the case may be. But they don't want us to all come together and say we have a common oppressor. And we do. And that's what Martin Luther King was doing. And uh, what happened to him? That's why they took him out.
Mm -hmm. But I, I would also add to that, though, I also think it's important that you lift up those that are oppressed, because even in a class movement, the people at the bottom, if we talk about something that Bernie had in reference to the universal policies, policies, yes, uh, it lifts all boats, but the people at the bottom would still be at the bottom. So we also have a have to have a conversation about equity as as well, in my opinion. Well, there's there's one there's there's two things we have to do. I agree with you. The nature of the ideology that I work on and espouse is that it focus on the working class. And when you're focusing on the working class, you're focusing on the poor, you're focusing on a um, the kinds of things that help those at the bottom. On the Bernie Sanders of the world, here's the comment I'll have. I'll, I'll put it to you like this. The discussion from the Bernie Sanders types of the world, the so-called democratic socialists, the, the people who are you know trying to align with the mainstream and here's where here's 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 the problem with them. Basically, they're arguing is I'm an American and there's a pie here. There's a big pie and some goes to the military industrial complex. Some goes to the bankers. I want to make sure that the working class gets their slice of the pie. Right. OK, I understand that. But there's a greater discussion. What about all the bodies that are baked in a pie from Africa, from Latin America? You know what I mean? Well, how was that pie cooked? That's imperialist. So what Ber Bernie will not address is the imperialism. So what Bernie's willing to say is we can screw over Venezuela and Cuba, Africa, Latin America. We can steal all of the ingredients to the pie, bake their bodies in the pie. But we're only going to discuss the part of the pie that we get. So to me, you can't be um, for the workers. You can't be in America. See, now you're you're saying in America, we're just, let's just look out for the American working class. To me, you have to be an internationalist. You have to say this is imperialism. And and what do we see right now? This imperialism is coming home right now. They're going after the the African People's Socialist Party, the Uhuru movement. They're charging people. They're going after um, Cop City. The whole thing, they're trying to stop censorship. They're going, so the idea that you can ignore the imperialism of the U.S. empire overseas and just try to get your piece of that pie that is an evil pie and not understand that at some point that imperialism is going to come home to you is absolute foolishness. That's the problem I got with the Bernies and the AOCs of the world. They don't want to discuss the bodies and the, the ingredients of the pie, the theft that it, that, that it came from, and the fact that the direction that we're going takes you, you know, to a bad place. We're not going to a better place. We're going to a worse place. So, so, so what if you get a little piece of the pie for a while? At some point, it's going to all go bad anyway. And you need to change the system in a way that benefits the working class and takes into account the needs of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the people in general. Very well said, Garland. Garland, before you go, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me, of course, my YouTube channel. I'm on uh, Radio Sputnik. Uh, it's The Critical Hour, which is on Rumble. I'm also on Rumble. I'm on YouTube and on Rumble. I also have a show on WPFW. That's 89.3 FM Pacifica Radio in Washington, D.C. every Friday from 6 to 7 p.m. And uh, I'm on Telegram. I'm on YouTube and Instagram. I'm not on X. I guess I'm too far too dangerous for uh, X to allow me to be on the platform. <laughs> We, we got to talk about that one day. <laughs> talk to you about that one day. But Garland, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.